Okay, let us get going again with the second half of session two in 120 BC 20 B. Okay, where we left off right before the break was we were starting to think a little about how we use some analysis tools to help give us a little bit of information so that as we think about doing conceptual design, we can get some early feedback to guide our thinking. And again, we haven't really even thought at all about specific rooms and locations of things. We probably have done some sketching just to think about the overall size and shape. And we're just really trying to figure out the right form. What I'll often describe it in terms of the variables are we're thinking about the massing of the building, the kind of shape and is it tall and thin? Is it low and flat? Is it bend or twist? What is the orientation? We're just trying to understand how we can use those things to our advantage or avoid problems, you know, by sort of citing things well at a high level. And Format 360 is actually a really good tool for getting started with that. Format 360 creates Revit models. The biggest things it's good for relative to what we're up to, well, it's interesting. It does have all that kind of weather and wind data, which I think is actually kind of good. But we tend to use it to think about just doing conceptual energy analysis and looking at solar radiation, things like that. Plus, just going through and trying to find, oh, just an appropriate shape that has approximately the right number of square feet and stuff like that, which can often be a big task. Okay. Next up, though, another way to do this, which is completely related, because again, Format 360 just really is a piece of Revit, or they're essentially the same things, um, is to use the tool Revit itself. And in terms of what's going on there, you know, as we start to think about choosing a location where we get a weather station, that's all about the same. We have the whole notion of sun and shadows, and we have the whole notion of the energy use reports, which in many ways provide very similar information. But let's just kind of look at that very briefly so you can just sort of see how those two things stack up. Uh, I'll go into Revit now. We'll show you next time is how you actually can bring your file across. But I'm going to go over to the Windows side of the world. I'm going to say, let me go through and create a new architectural project. we'll get going here. Now, you might ask, why would you use one versus using the other? And it's really kind of hard to come up with a very precise answer about that. Um, Format 360 is a subset of everything that's available in Revit, but in a lot of ways, it's easier to work with Format 360. Um, it's more SketchUp-like. Some people like that in terms of pushing and pulling. In Revit, we often draw profiles and stretch things in a way that's a little bit more complicated. Um, the two can work together. Format 360 is also, because it's available on the web and also available on iPads and mobile environments, you can kind of do it just pretty much anywhere, whereas Revit have a whole lot of overhead. You're going to load up Revit, that's three gigabytes of pain you know, in installation, so it's harder to share. Um, Format 360 is also good for collaboration. If we wanted to sort of do that together, I could have shared and we could work on the same file at the same time. So it's pretty good that way. But in the world of Revit, how this works is very similar. I'll say manage, there's a lot more things to look at here. Go to a location. And again, I'll choose Scottsdale, Arizona. You see there's some different weather stations here. I'll say okay. If I go to the weather tab, You'll see there are those temperatures, although here, since my preferences are set to be Fahrenheit, I'm getting a clearer view. So on that nice balmy 113 degree day in like uh, July, yikes, um, getting down to 78, what is it, December. It stays pretty warm there most of the time. Those are the cooling design temperatures. There must be heating ones in here too. But it's all sort of the same data. The heating design temperature is just 40. That's interesting. OK, a little side information if it's reoriented. But it all starts with choosing a location. Different weather stations we could use if we want to. Okay. 
It doesn't have the ability to go through and bring a satellite image. That's one thing I like about Torment. If I want to do something like that, what I need to do is go out and grab a satellite image from Google Earth or something like that, and I can import it and scale it and kind of use it. Yeah, but that's not too awfully bad. That's actually how I did it back in 228. If you were there and we had the, the site, which was the uh, shopping center site, what I actually did was I created the initial model in Formant, okay, then brought it across, because in Formant I could trace the outside you know, boundaries. So even as you're thinking about doing your existing building in a neighborhood, you might start in Formant and kind of do the shape of the buildings around it, and then bring it into Revit. A little easier that way. Okay, so I'm hanging out in here. In this environment, I say massing in sight, and you choose to create an in-place mass, and now you'll see why. You probably, it's just that in form, it's a little bit easier to do. But I can go through and draw a profile of the building. A little more precise, super. What I will do is, I'm just rotate that into 3D. Is choose that. I'll say let's create a form out of it. Finish that up. Once I have that, I can now, because I have a form, put in some mass floors. Not very many floors. Maybe put another floor in here just so we have one more in there. that third floor. And I'll apologize this is going fast. We did a lot of stuff in 220A. If you haven't had 220A, not to worry, we can get you caught up on some of this stuff. This is just flying around in Reddit just because I want to show you some just very basic stuff over here. But we'll get you caught up. Okay, so here's basically that same sort of form. If I want to look at the sun in shadows, I can turn on the sun. What? Just go through and... Turn on the shadows, so we can start to see just how the shadows are hitting at different times of the day. 10 p.m. is not very good, is it? 9.30 a.m. Okay, start to see how the shadows are hitting. But we can also go through and either do the energy analysis. We, a lot of us did this last time, where we went through and said under the Analyze tab, we wanted to go through and create an energy model. Okay, and from that energy model, we can go ahead and run the energy analysis reports to do that. But even, well, we can't get sun and shadow out here, but if we do run the energy reports, oh, looks like it's going to do an update. I accept all these things because I don't have any other choices. So I'll just create a new report and it will send it off to the cloud. Ultimately, what it's going to do is exactly the same. It's using the same calculation engine, it's using the same assumptions in either tool. You get exactly the same result. There's really nothing there. It's just really which interface you prefer to go at it through. But this one gives you a little more information about just exactly, you know, what is contributing to the energy loss or something like that. It's just a little more information to operate on. Okay. Let me go back over. Oops, not there. To the reporting. It's still running right there. What I want to show you is that that same information about the wind roses and the temperature profiles and stuff like that, it shows up in Revit just down at the bottom of these energy reports. Okay, so when it's done processing, let's see if we can get it to finish itself up. 92%, as many of you know, it gets to 90 some odd percent, and promises you so much, and then denies you at the last moment. Although 98 looks pretty good. I mean, Seng Chai spent a lot of time looking at uh, 
So in these reports, it'll report the energy use intensity. It's interesting, it uses a different system in terms of the units it uses to report it back. But we see we get some information about like how we're doing in terms of energy use versus the potential. We have some ideas just based on these initial assumptions. We put very little in there. It looks like so far, as far as cooling load, those southern facing windows look like they could use a little shading or something like that. We're getting a lot of cooling there. We're also getting some cooling load from window conductance. So I want windows that not only have a better kind of U value, a better conductance value, but also some sort of solar heat gain, or some sort of shading, maybe a low E glass, or maybe some shades on those windows. Over here on the heating side, what's going on? It looks like our biggest source of heat loss is just the walls right now. So we think about putting some insulation in those walls or something like that. But again, we're sort of too early for that because that's gonna come a little bit later. There's sort of the fuel and consumption graph. But here are all those wind roses. So wind roses for different times of the year. We have, oh, the temperature ranges, humidity ranges. There's really a lot of data available in here. It's just kind of down at the bottom of the report where we haven't been looking very much. Okay, so a really good thing to do, even before you design your building very far, is just really, once you sort of know what the site is, Go ahead and put a box out there. Go ahead and put a box out there that's, oh, 100 feet by 50 feet by 40 feet tall. Just put a box out there and just run this sort of report and sort of see what kind of feedback you get because your building will be much smarter than that. But it'll start to give you, it's a little easier than just shooting in the dark in terms of trying to assume what's going on. Okay, so that's all we'll do with Revit today. Just a little bit like that, just to get ourselves going. Because what I really wanted to do more than anything today, close that up over there, is we'll get into all the modeling tools, but the point is really start with conceptual design <coughs> before you start digging into the precise locations of all the rooms and the walls and all that kind of stuff. Let's just think about the overall shape and form, okay, as well as just some design inspirations. <coughs> so let me start talking about the design project and how we're going to approach that. Okay, for the design project, here's the way it basically lays out. You are going to work on some project that you're going to faithfully carry through the entire quarter. So you're going to kind of start now with some really architectural design for what it wants to be. Okay, we'll think about the layout, how the, the hallways and the stairways and the layout of the rooms and the circulation and the egress work. And then we'll work on the structure, the mechanical systems, all those different systems layering into that building. Okay. So it's kind of a cool project. There's very few things that you get to follow through in that much detail. In terms of the specifics of the building you want to do, this whole notion of a sustainable design center is really just you know, a prompt that is useful. That's what we've been using for a lot of the projects that we've been working on the last couple of quarters. If you'd like to propose your own project, I know like some people like Gustavo already had an idea for a specific building in a specific context that's a little different. You're welcome to do that too. My only sort of guidance about the size or just sort of the building that you want us to keep in mind, I want to make sure it's sort of enough to be interesting to you, okay? But I would say be thinking about a building that's somewhere, oh, like, you know, 15 to 20 to 25,000. That's probably enough square footage for what we need. If you get much bigger, you're probably going to repeat the same things over and over again. If it's much smaller, it's almost too small. You won't really hit some interesting issues. So somewhere in there is kind of a good design guideline. But let me just kind of show you the prompt for the sustainable design center. And the idea is what you can do is if you wanted to propose your own, then we're just going to come up with a, a similar sort of prompt for your design instead. Okay, so. Let me get out the brief and we'll kind of just walk you through that and you can use that as a guideline. No, don't do that. Okay, 
dot C D Okay, so here is the brief. So the idea in this building was we wanted to go through and try to design some sort of a center that was going to be an elegant and functional building that would really exemplify sustainable building principles. And since a lot of what we did in this class was all about sustainability and systems to promote it, it was kind of a cool project to think about trying to do a building that exhibited as well as exemplified those things. So it was going to have some featured exhibition space and resources for visitors to come explore. You know, the idea is that people can come and see things implemented here and then use them in their own buildings. Oh, I like that idea. What if I did something like that in my building instead? You know, all ages, varying degrees of interest, so you could get families and school groups, just the general public who was sort of interested in sustainability but didn't know very much about it, who sort of wanted to know what was going on in this funny word they keep hearing about, as well as design professionals. You know, it could be a space where they get together you know, meet with other professionals, have like a space where they sort of see the latest technologies and just, you know, it's a home for them, a place to sort of like, you know, be a hub. Okay. The idea was that, you know, we were going to design the building into a series of phases and as we keep on going, we're just going to keep on enhancing the building, adding additional modeling and analysis techniques to just uh, keep on getting more and more detail about uh, what's going on like how we design. So a number of intermediate milestones, also known as check-in dates leading to the final design, during which you'll receive close consultation and assistance from the teaching team. And what that means is basically, what we did last quarter is we pretty much checked in with each other once a week, where in addition to class, there was a time where either for 30 to uh, 60 minutes, we sat down and looked at your specific design and just sketched together and said, oh, this is kind of interesting. What if you tried that? Oh, you have a question about this? How about that? So it's very kind of hands-on in terms of just being mentored through the whole process. So Alana and I will be doing that again. Okay. You'll also be recording the process in the form of a live blog website, sort of the whole notion of you journal week by week, which you're thinking, starting with your earliest design inspirations, and kind of just moving through the whole process. And it's amazing to see how the projects evolve and change. We looked at Ahalabi's uh, entry last time, uh, but you go to so the Bimtopia site, you can see people's design journals from the past several quarters. And it's sort of amazing what people have uh, come up with just to see how your, your process changes and things. Okay. For the sites for the design center, we provided a couple of different sites, one at Jasper Ridge and one kind of near the dish. Okay. Beautiful views of the local wildlife. You were going to create your uh, building on the hillside. Kind of a nice site up there in the foothills. So if you're working on those, those are certainly available to you to kind of look up in our hillside. Um, but you could also go ahead and do a building like this in some other areas. But if you're also thinking about a specific building in a different region or something like that, no worries. We'll go ahead and help you basically pull in some topography files and some local files that sort of explain the context there too. So be thinking about sort of what kind of building and where it wants to be. For the program, for the exhibition center, the idea was going to be somewhere oh, 16,000 to 20,000 square feet. Okay, Since it was going to be on a hillside here, we probably have multiple levels. That makes it a little more interesting. The idea for the sustainable center it would have kind of a guest lobby welcoming area. It has some exhibit spaces for both permanent and temporary exhibits. It has kind of kid-focused play zones where they could actually experience sustainable technologies firsthand. So it might be really cool, oh, just someplace where if you were in the building and you were talking about different types of window glazing and how they block or allow heat to come through, just to have a section that's one type of glazing, a section that's another type of glazing, and a third. So you know, people could actually stand behind and really feel what the effect is. Or if someone came up with a really neat idea, oh, if you were thinking about Thermal, uh, you know, the ground thermal heating and sort of what the temperature is in the ground. To actually have like a big glass panel where you can see the ground and have temperature sensors like at every step in the way so you can really see the difference between the surface and what happens when you go just a few feet into the ground. Yeah, just any number of things. Okay, the idea was that the building would also have some education spaces for seminar rooms where when professionals wanted to get together in the evening for a class to learn about something, you know, they could come and meet and take advantage of the space. A couple large classroom or conference rooms. Okay. 
a visitor cafe because if you come on in here and you just want a place to uh, kind of sit and relax part way through experiencing it, it'd be nice to have not a full restaurant, but a place where you can get some sandwiches or something like that, just sit down and enjoy some coffee and <coughs> maybe enjoy the fantastic view of the foothills. And even a gift shop, because everybody has some sort of gift shop which would feature books and educational materials and stuff like that to kind of talk about it. So the idea was that it was mostly sort of a public exhibition sort of space. It should also, we suggested, have some offices for the director who would stay here as well as some administrative staff and volunteer docents who helped maintain it, some storage space, some utility space for mechanical and electrical equipment, stairs, restrooms, things like that. So you really have to kind of think about a building on many levels. This building really had, yeah, I'd almost say it has three main functions the way we look at it. There was sort of the main kind of public exhibition space that was very, very public. There were the education and training rooms which were like semi-public. And then there were the office spaces which were more private. Okay, but you know, all those things sort of work together. So the idea in this prompt is to just really, for the first phase, this is what you should start thinking about with whatever you're coming up with is your idea. Just really think about the overall form of the building and the initial design concept, the strategies you might use. But I think for if you're going to do something different than the sustainable design center, start by just sort of identifying what the building is and what its program might look like. If you had to write. those same two paragraphs right here for your space, what would the bullet points be there? Because that's really just the, uh, the menu or the, the, the design prompt that's going like, to guide us through everything. So just think about what it's going to be. Okay. So actually, Gustavo, can I pick on you for a little bit in terms of your building? Uh -huh. I know you, you have a, a fairly well-defined concept about what you're after in terms of like uh, sort of thinking about this. So just share with us, like, yeah, sort of what are you thinking about now? Like in terms of, yeah, just, you know, it's, it's just an open studio. So it's like, yeah, tell, tell us what you're thinking, because it might inspire some other people as they think about their project. Well, for my project, this class, I was thinking about using an existing building. So it's uh, like an old city hall. It was built in, like, 1970. And it's unused, so my plan is to, like, retrofit it and, like, keep the existing facade. So that'll be part of the evaluation. We'll sort of see as we, in our performance-based design, we'll sort of see how well we can sort of get it to perform and see if we actually hit the net zero. It's like, what sort of functions are going to be there? What are you going to do with this building? It's, it's, the, the reuse of the historic shell is always kind of a really cool idea. So, so what's going to be in your new incarnation of what this building's going to be? Um, as of now, I'm going to have like office space. Maybe like the top floor will be office space. And then the bottom, like, the biggest can be three levels. So the bottom two levels. So like, who uses this space? Tell me about yeah, who, who's your user? Like, uh, like who's in the offices or who comes to the building during the day to uh, take advantage of some of these spaces? So I think for the office space, it's, it can be anyone, any company that needs like office space. So like commercial office, as opposed to city offices or something like that, just more like commercial office space, write it out that way, okay? And then the bottom, the, the conference rooms, they could be used for the same, the same tenure. Thank you. 
quite a community center and stuff like that. And a lot of our older towns are smaller towns. It's nice to sort of bring some life. We were talking about the whole community it's in where out on the highway, the, the outlet malls are kind of coming in and it sucked a lot of life out of the main downtown area, which is still very nice and interesting architecturally, but doesn't have as much life anymore, it seems. And so things that sort of bring life back into kind of the core seem kind of attractive because it's sort of very walkable down there. Or it's just, you know, a lot of affordances of what's really nice about an older town. So when you say community center, I'd encourage you to keep on just defining it even more closely because the office space, I get that, you know, sort of a commercial office space, it could be anyone, it could be a small software company or a web company or whatever, you know, something's happening up there. For the community spaces, think about things that can bring life and energy into the space. So, you know, you know, grandma's quilting club could be in there as well as just whoever else wants to rent it. That's kind of good. But even day to day, I think about, you know, do you want to have any daycare in there? Like where there's sort of a steady flow of kids in and out in part of the facility? Or when you start thinking about youth development, I always like things, you know, maybe part of it is attached to more like a sports center where there are some courts and just places where kids can come after school and hang and sort of be with other kids. You know, there could be like a, oh, like a learning center where like interactive media or access to computers for people who don't have them in their own homes. It's hard to imagine these days, isn't it? But still not everyone does. You know, just things that will bring life in and somehow, like kind of interesting, what is, what is our community center today? It used to be like, if you asked me like 10 years ago, community center sort of died out, but everyone went to like Barnes and Noble and hung out there or Borders. Now you go to Starbucks, you know, something like, so what is community center? What brings people together? Like what makes it, what's gonna make your place a place that's so nice that I'm just gonna go hang because in fact, even that, oh, a good idea that came up in 228, you know, the idea of those startup spaces where, you know, it's almost like temporary offices for people who they want to interact with other people, other people who are sort of interested in entrepreneurial and they want to connect together as opposed to being closed. I don't know. It's, it's a lot of ways to think about it. Yeah, I was thinking about doing like a small auditorium for like performing arts. Oh, fantastic. Like stand up comedy. Like that. Even better, because if, if we can get people down there and think about what's going to get them down there during the day, what's going to get them in the evening and at nights, on Friday nights. It's, it's so weird about what it takes to give vibrancy like to a community and what it is to be give you critical mass and the feeling of a hub. So, you know, I highly encourage you to keep on thinking very creatively about this in terms of how you really, you know, make a very positive social impact by creating this very energized, positive space. You know, that might be the beginning of a new hub. So, no, no, thanks, that's it, that's just thanks for sharing. You know, it's just, I wanna just throw stuff out there. So. You know, are you guys thinking about anything particular that, or is it just still, we're just uh, kind of fishing around in our mind? Any ideas you want to like uh, throw up against the wall, or not yet? Um, well, I don't know, I, I was kind of just in doing like the Google uh, website. Okay. Like the rehab center maybe. Oh, fantastic. That could be really, really cool. Okay, so tell me about that. One, yeah. So. This is very cool. I have a friend who does like it's bird like a uh, center where they basically rehabilitate injured birds and stuff like that. Like what kind of animals would come to yours? I'm not that far. Okay, um, no worries. The one I worked at was like local local wildlife would just go. Um, so like bears, possums, squirrels. Really? So things that wander in and get injured somehow? Yeah, like the parent things by cars or yeah. the dogs go after it. Yeah. It's a, I like the idea of the center, only in that I like the idea that you'll have sort of this very functional thing going on, there's kind of a medical need and a rehabilitative need, but it could also have this sort of public side, where there could be a little bit of an education it's center. For the animals that don't get to leave. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so I think that that kind of appeals to me. But again, yeah, you're going with a lot of this stuff. 
an apple bobby will tell you. Yeah, I throw out a lot of random opinions about different things. So a lot of things appeal to me, but that doesn't mean, yeah, it's, it's all just advice. Take it for what it's worth, but don't feel guided. Yeah, I'm restricted by it at all. So I don't know. That sounds cool. I think that's actually, yeah, I like that you're thinking about something. In fact, both of you, for Gustavo and you, you know, something that's personally meaningful to you. Yeah, so I think you'll, you'll have more fun with it if you really approach it that way. Yeah. Uh, Sang Chai, is anything like grabbing you yet, or what are you thinking? Is anything uh, yet? I think I'll be pretty much uh, sticking with this concept of sustainable design. Right, Might be interesting that way. Oh yeah, it's a good prompt unto itself. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of good ground to cover there. Yeah, and since so many of us sort of are involved in thinking about sustainable living, because it's sustainable, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about how you can embody that in the building. Okay, very good. So now, how about then just really between now and Tuesday, okay, just be thinking about this and even a couple different things. Yeah, uh, if you're coming up with a, we'll, we'll set up some meetings to check in individually with you next week. And at that meeting, okay, if you're coming up with your own program, kind of think about what the high level bullet points are going to be, stuff like that. Um, another thing that would be really good is, even if you're sticking with a standard program, go out and find what I'll call design inspirations. Okay, so I think that's the tail end of what it says in here. Define the overall thing. What is it? It's just thinking about the overall strategies for you know, how you're going to approach the design. But a really good way for a lot of people to start is surf around the web, find different buildings that interest you. Ooh, that one had a really interesting facade, or I really like what's going on in the skylight there. Just grab a lot of pictures of things that just sort of interest you, or of other wildlife centers, or other community centers. Just, just grab things that are interesting to you, because it's really, it's always hard to know how to get started like this. The, the hardest thing ever is just this big white canvas, and there's just, it's unbounded. So for all of these things, you know, we're gonna say, okay, let's find a site that you think is gonna work, and then we'll try and use that site and your inspirations to start narrowing in on it and start giving your building some form. But don't worry about it just yet. It'll start taking form next week. Okay, and through some sketching and working together, you know, you know, you know, really what's going to happen as an overview of what's going to happen is that uh, over the next two weeks, a lot of the form will start to be dictated so that we can then start putting systems into the form. Okay, the first two weeks are very critical in terms of just, you know, you've got to come up with something that sort of makes sense. Okay, and as we're doing that, we'll sort of look ahead to think about how some of your early design decisions might affect your HVAC strategy and your lighting strategy and some of that stuff, because if you think ahead, you know, it changes the way you would sort of start approaching it from the beginning. Like, Apple Lobby would attest to, there's, I think he would, there's this whole thing that, by the time you get to the end of this course, and you know everything you know there, you, you really wish you knew it at the beginning, because it's very cyclical. It's this whole sort of thing that, you, you don't really realize how hard it is to get everything to stay together and work it as an integrated system until you do them all independently and you realize, oh, okay, you want to do it again. But, uh, I don't know, there's no time for that. Okay, beauty, let us then adjourn for today. Uh, be thinking about site and context and your building and kind of some design inspirations. And when we get back together on Tuesday, we will give you some specific guidance about how your idea, your bullet points start taking more of a shape of a building, how we start breaking that into forms and thinking about aggregating them so that, you know, <laughs> the building will arise from the foam. Okay? Beauty. Let us adjourn then.